tells about how and sometimes i get in i do that I, I get wrapped around the axle going down a path to try to explain all the technical details but most people pretty much everybody's not really interested in all the technical details they just, just want, want a general answer. answer they want the answer they just want a general answer well, that's that, not that, always true yeah not always it true. depends it depends yeah oh my god Today's special guest. Yeah, you're the special guest, Pekka. <laughs> now I'm stressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesus. I could have made it bigger. Here, I can, I can still make sure, it bigger. Yeah, make sure, it yes. yeah, make the there we go. Here, here we are. Like, Pekka, Pekka star, here we right? are. That's yeah, good. Guest star. Yeah. Right there. The guest okay. star, Pekka Haltila. <laughs> My God. Okay. Co-starring Pekka Hatala, written by <laughs> Pekka Hatala, produced by Pekka Hatala, <laughs> directed by Pekka Hatala. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. And I'll begin to, how do you say when you are uh, talking slowly? Uh, how do you, what do you say about that? Uh, stutter. Oh, you start the stuttering? Oh, uh, yeah. Some people, yeah, they, they do. Yeah, I I think everyone, maybe almost everyone except for professional speakers, have some little bit of speech impediment, a little bit. Sure. And most people would say, oh, I don't have that at speech impediment. I have a lot of speech impediment. I think you know. So you don't. I do. Um, you you uh, you have you born with the camera in hand. I mumble. <laughs> okay. so, do you I remember my is, my first it's gonna, broadcast? It's going to give me an F. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my first broadcast, uh, I didn't know. The problem is that I haven't speak English in t almost 20 years. Yeah, you I told have, us that. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. You're, on a, you're on a crash course now. That's good. Yeah, because I read, I listen, I watch, and, and, and so on, but... Uh, but the output has been minimal. I, I'm thinking in, sometimes in English because some language is easier to think, like astronomy, in, in some language. Do you think that? No, because you only uh, probably think in English. But I have three three languages. I have Swedish, Finnish, oh. and English. Oh, okay. So my mother language is Finnish, and my day language is Swedish. And now it becomes equal to English. So I I, I like to speak more English daily. So I I I turned everything my windows my my everything. iphone everything on english well that helps a lot i imagine i'm, I'm sorry yeah. <laughs> everything is in english but in windows it it makes a problem because the times and locations and so on um, i have a little bit problems with that the form the number formats and yes, the time uh, formats uh, yeah. exactly yeah mm -hmm. but i i think i got chased it but that's another problem <laughs> Yeah, that, and I've, I've learned to, in, in some respects, it's a very small example of the similar thing is when I, I, I'm pretty fluent in metric and in English units. Uh, I can think that way, but it's that's just a small example of what you're talking about. Uh, and then the only other example I have personally is different program languages. You know, I can read and interpret it directly. Um, yeah. And that's well, more have, symbology. That's more symbology than it is, you know, actual words. But it's still, it's still a similar thing when you translate between different programming languages to get the same, the same structures and the same things like that. You know, I'm fluent in in probably six or eight different programming languages. But that's not that's not near the same as uh, a spoken language or written. You know. In, uh, human language type thing. Yeah. I just learned inch. 
<laughs> oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> to multi- multiply. <laughs> That's good. Good start. Our plan is the setting. The feats are uh, most difficult. Miles, okay, that's fine. Because 50 miles an hour is equal to our 80 kilometers. We're driving a car. <laughs> so. Right. The fleet of Earth observing satellites operated by NASA and its partners illuminate the links between these systems. Temperatures on the planet affect all of them, which means each one is impacted by a warming climate. During 2020, Global temperatures match the warmest year we've measured, and we experienced the most active hurricane season ever recorded, with many storms quickly intensifying, likely as a result of warmer seas. Heat in the oceans is like fuel that powers these massive storms. But incredibly, dust swept up from northern Africa actually plays a critical role in the formation of hurricanes. It's also a key source of fertilization for the Amazon rainforest. Due to climate change, dust plumes are expected to decline, and then so will their impacts on vegetation and ocean away. Our satellites and field research allow us to pay close attention to the Amazon rainforest and other vegetation across the world, helping us track how fires, deforestation, and disasters affect the world's plant life. We can also study how those vegetation changes in turn impact air quality, waterways, and the climate. That same science helps the world's farmers boost productivity and deal with extreme weather, including drought, early freezes, and heavy spring rains. The observations can also help track some unwanted byproducts of food production. Fertilizers used in farming contain high amounts of nutrients to help crops grow, but those same nutrients can cause sometimes dangerous blooms of algae in waterways, which can affect local economies, recreation, fishing, and human health. They're often so large, they're easily viewed from space. Clean water and clean air are two cornerstones for maintaining healthy people and wildlife. Satellite data and NASA funding help map how animal migrations are affected by water sources, as well as light pollution and habitat loss, and also helps find solutions. The view from space is especially important in the Arctic and Antarctic, where animal habitats are rapidly changing due to climate change. And so is the ice itself, with Greenland and Antarctica losing enough ice in just 16 years to raise sea level by half an inch globally. We can also measure snow and ice farther from the poles, such as vital snowpacks in the Sierra Nevada and Rockies, and in the Himalayas, where rapidly draining glacial lakes can cause sudden and dangerous bursts of water downstream. Earth's climate is changing, and with it has come a new intensity to weather events and hazards that can lead to disasters, including floods, fires, hurricanes, and heat waves. As disasters become more frequent and intense, NASA will use its satellites and resources to study the effects of climate change on natural systems and to connect people to technology that can build a more resilient world. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific, uh, and I'm here with Jerry Hubble and Pekka Hautala. Uh, and Pekka is our special guest here on International Earth Day. So uh, it's uh, it's great to have you here, Pekka. You were on yesterday talking about um, dark skies. I have you muted, by the way, so you need to unmute yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, there we go. There Thank we go. You, Scott. 
Yeah, I was Scott. having a, the, the, the volume in the video that I chose was not very high, and so sometimes I get great audio in these videos and sometimes not. So yeah. anyways, um, but, uh, you know, uh, you've been making uh, huge progress, Pekka, in the fight against dark skies uh, yes. in Sweden. And so uh, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, hear your story. Yes, everything began with uh, the first light pollution filter I did. And th then came the second version I sold. And uh, I was thinking that uh, this is not the right way to fight the light pollution. I, this is not only me. This is the whole whole planet who is suffering of this and a whole community. I, I was watching yesterday evening at night around the, this area only, and I found five, six windows that are direct hit at the nighttime, bedroom oh. windows. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I, um, I thought something must be done. Okay, and what can be done? <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, first I contacted Ida and uh, they sent me a link that I was watching uh, uh, first training one on one video and uh, got uh, very, very many point of views that I even thought about, about the trees. They mm. got uh, suffering about the light pollution. They are plumbing up. That's right. Earlier. You're talking, than, you're talking about the International Dark Sky Association website. Yes, either, right? yeah. Yep. And I saw the video that they, they showed trees from di di different directions and different places, the same kind of tree and, and the dark place and the light pollution place. And uh, where there was a dark place, they felt their leaves on autumn. But in the very light polluted area with lead lights, they still keep their leaves because they are thinking there is a lot, enough light hmm. from from lead lights they got that much light wow. that they they think there are such a much uh, amount of light not f directly uh, sunlight because the trees are collecting uh, vitamins from sunlight but this is the uh, photons that they are also collecting and i thought okay i'm on i'm I am full, full on on this boat mm -hmm. and uh, straight ahead. And uh, I thought, okay, which way to, and I sent them to mail that uh, I am indeed interesting to be an, and uh, what they call them, uh, not an advocate, an advocate. Advocate, yes, uh, on Sweden and looked for their, uh, I was watching their. Uh, homepage and there is none in Sweden or in Finland. So maybe I can take both because I speak fluent Swedish and Finnish. So, but I have friends in Finland who are astronomers. So I send yeah. them the mail. I send them to mail so they can take over in Finland. So we can co cooperate because they have different politicians and, and different regulation and so on. But uh, anyway, I sent two maids to uh, a party here in Sweden that called the Green Party, Environment Party, driving the green politician, and uh, gave me my contact information and uh, told them that uh, I'm driving this. Uh, uh, kind of uh, business of, about the dark skies and who is the right uh, 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 terminal in your organization, your political <laughs> organization, and uh, give me a call because I don't want to blah, blah, blah this for everyone in one hour and they, they, they tell me that, uh, ah, sorry, I am a wrong person. Yeah, yeah. And I will, I will, another, yes, <laughs> yes, right? yes, mm -hmm. as usual is. So I just want, need to direct terminal who is in charge. And one hour later, I got the call, telephone call. 
from a local politician. And she was asking, what is the purpose? And I asked her, what is your position in the political party? And mm. she was telling her, the problem is, the problem is. And I took, I, then I just asked her, okay, what is your politi political party's uh, uh, like uh, big picture? What, what are you trying to achieve with yeah. your kind of politician you are driving here in Sweden? And she told me that, okay, the big picture is that they want to, everybody have uh, equal uh, quality of life uh, in environmental mm -hmm. equal quality of life, every living thing and so on. I, I agreed, totally agreed. Okay, I they told her, okay, we now we have a level number one and mm -hmm. now we are breaking it down. And the next level is... For me, it's the light in cities. And directly she told me that, okay, Stockholm is divided in many, many, many small communities, or how do you say? Right. Uh, that's, a, that's the right way. Yeah, yeah, small, that they are in charge for. And uh, therefore they can't decide on top level something because they, well, everybody has to decide something. Okay, I told that, that that's a good start, but who is in charge for all those small things? And she gave me a name, and and uh, and uh, she will send me. Uh, then I asked uh, if she has something that is documented what has been taken up in government uh, level, and she told that she has heard there was some talk about uh, light, uh, the lamp designs in Stockholm, about the cover designs. Okay, uh, and I asked, uh, can you pass by uh, links or documents what has been taken up in government level, uh, uh, like propositions and uh, what has been decided and what has been put down or something. Every document that I have, I, I have to, right now, my next week's uh, doing this is to collect so much documents from United States, from American Medical Association, Human and Enver Environmental Effect of Light, emit the diet community lighting uh, document report from 2016. <laughs> I got to get hand on that document. Uh, so uh, I have to look where to find that document from the United States. And uh, then there is a police reports. They have looked up uh, for the criminality and so on. So next week's task is collect as much documentation I ever get, can when I go upstairs to the big boys. That's something, Pekka, that's something that's really, there are a couple of competing ideas here with the lighting and but there but they could uh, there, there is common solutions for this for everybody in terms of, of security lighting and that's the main thing is security lighting in the dark sky right yeah. people seem to think you need to broadcast or or shine lights as brightly and as fully as you need as you can to protect property yeah, from I criminality that. right but it doesn't have but again it there's there's common you solutions don't have to, to shield you don't have to shine i mean the sky you don't have to shine yeah, the light that's, of the sky that's my point you just shine the, it at the ground right? yes that's my point that's so the that's main the common point. thing right so that's yes that and, is my main point yeah. that we can shield the light to point on that direction with that amount of light we need at that time we need uh, we have a very local airport that it's closed down uh, because of COVID. No planes landing, no planes lifting, but the lights are full on day and night. Mm -hmm. Why? So that's the question. And that, uh, when I was thinking about that, that uh, get me a VASP, uh, photon VASP injection. Really. <laughs> so um, uh, 
it will take time. She told me that it will take some time. I thought I have 45. I have expected that I live to 100 years. So I have 45 years on me. <laughs> and then after that, somebody has to take over. But 45 years, I have time. Yeah, that's plenty of time. <laughs> fight. You should be able to get Yeah, that's done. plenty of time. Yeah. <clears throat> of if, if nothing else, I can learn some somebody to do that for me. <laughs> Some young people, <laughs> but uh, that's yeah, that's my. Uh, my uh, I, I'm I'm surprised how I mean honestly surprised how quickly they responded to you. Which yes, is well, me too. Very me too. impressive. Very me impressive. Me too. And and a uh, party, a political party, an environment political party called me. This small. Hmm. Uh, what do you call? Not even this, what do you look in one your person. microscope? One person. No, as, right. as small as you can see on your microscope, Scott. So small I am mm. in those big pictures. But uh, it only takes, really takes usually one to yeah. make things happen. There's, um, I was watching a documentary about how the national parks were developed in the United States, you know. And uh, uh, the national park system uh, also inspired other countries to develop national parks. But almost every national park in the United States got really started by just one person. Yes. You know, fighting hard, uh, you know, trying to interact with the government officials. But uh, it can almost always be traced back down to one. And yeah. so... So never think that uh, you're only one voice and you can't make much of a difference because that's how it's done. Yeah, um, I was I was reading uh, American history. I'm very interested in uh, American history. That uh, there was uh, one article about uh, the uh, apple seed that you have, and it came back to 1800 before. Uh, every immigrants and so on they moved in the middle of uh, out uh, to the coasts and so on but there was one man that realized that uh, because the state both land to immigrants but they uh, but the deal was that they have to grow 100 apple trees on their property with what which they uh, got from the government United States government mm -hmm. and there was one man that uh, had a very big plant of apple trees and he was he knew in what area they are moving these immigrants so he had planted before apple trees uh, so he could sell them to the immigrants when they moved on their mark. So he made business on apple trees, plants, small plants. So they didn't have, they were already like a meter high and he sold them to them. <laughs> so here you have 100 and this costs so much. And they was happy. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is business. <laughs> Is that Wonderful. is that Johnny Appleseed? Is that who you said that was? Yes, I, I think Johnny so. Johnny Appleseed, yeah. Yeah, very mm -hmm. old man. He was yeah. uh, like uh, very, very tall, like two meters. <laughs> a very thin, very thin old man. But he did a business with apple tree plants. That's right. Yeah, and it, that story's known all over the world. And just one guy. So. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I will... Uh, that's that's wonderful part in my life just now, uh, fighting light pollution because now I have time the whole summer and whole uh, late summer to make contacts, both in, in around the world and here in Sweden, how to work further because it will take time. I don't I don't make everything in one week or seven days and we have one resting day Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not that. I'm not that. Not that. <laughs> that we don't know. One man. One man did. One man did. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Pekka, yeah, thanks uh, for coming on to our program and giving us yet another update. So yeah, uh, when I 
make process, I will contact you, Scott. Okay, sounds real good. All right. Thank you, Scott, and everybody. Thanks, Pekka. Take Thank care. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. So um, normally we would have uh, Tyler Bowman on too, but uh, we'll have him on next time. Uh, Jerry, what's happening out there in the Open Go To community? Well, we're we're continuing to uh, hear from customers that are doing upgrades uh, to the firmware that I talked about last week. I guess it was a week ago. I talked about mm -hmm. and it demonstrated how to install the uh, the upgrade for the firmware and the. Uh, ASCOM driver. I actually started a survey on the forum that I can let me bring it up here. I can show you the results to date right now. We've had a couple of uh, issues with customers, as we always expect. Uh, not everybody um, is going to have a perfect experience, you know. Sure. There's always such a wide variation of computers and other things and skills and knowledge that we expect to have to help people over some humps every once in a while. Let's see if I can bring up this web page. Um, uh, let's see. I'll zoom up on it a little bit here. Um, so let me share my. Whoops. Let me share my screen. So <clears throat> I basically asked three separate questions with three or four different answers. Uh, the first and what type of mount people had. Okay. And that's these first three. And, and it looks like um, we've had uh, 15, 30 some responses already. It's only been a couple of days or a day and a half. It's not bad. Okay. No, that's a pretty good response. We've got, we do have 600 and some people on the forum. So. I expect we'll get a hundred responses, maybe if we're if we're everything's good, maybe or fifty to a hundred responses, hopefully. But again, and then I I wanted to know if people planned on doing the update or if they had already done it. So that's these first ones. So there was like three votes that said I don't plan on updating to the new firmware. I'm happy with the currently installed version. So we're going to always have people that aren't going to do the upgrade because they don't see a need for it. Uh -huh. uh, and I don't know if that's because they they read the uh, read the improvements or the list of features that we added or changed or updated and did, they decided they didn't care about those and this said well I'm not going to bother yeah maybe they're comfortable in the way they're that they're comfortable with the way it's working now yeah and then and then some people have, have plan on doing it but they haven't found the time yet and then people have already done it so about that's about half and half, you know. It's still early in the game. Uh, 14 people that responded said they haven't done it yet and they plan on it. And then 11 people have already done it. And then I asked about what kind of problems they had. You know, eight, eight people said they had no problems doing the update. Three votes said they had minor problems that they were able to figure out for themselves. And then the, the, the third group, nine, two votes had major problems doing the update and needed help, which is fine. So, this is and this this these people, the major you know, people that had problems and reached out for help were were helping them on the forum, mm -hmm. and uh, it's interesting because some of it has to do with our instructions. I think a lot of it has to do with the way we explain things, and we need to get better at it all the time. Yeah, you know, we approach things and the explanation from a certain point of view because we know how everything works, and sometimes we don't think about how other people look at the system and might say, well, that's confusing in terms of the steps. Uh, why do I need to do it this way? And as opposed to another way, they may have thought in their mind that it's, it works a certain way, but it actually doesn't. So they they misunderstand what the step is for or why, or why they had to do it a certain way, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And it just takes further explanation or instruction uh the main thing to do with instructions is to make it as like a recipe like a cookbook where they you don't really have to think about it you just follow the steps and it works so that's something we need to improve all the time in in terms of um, initial knowledge we try to try to make the documentation as complete as we can and some and a lot of times you know we've got the mindset that people are going to 
read everything that we provide, but that's not the case at all. We right. can't assume many that, people you know. don't want to read. <laughs> right. So, so I tried to provide a quick start guide, which is really like a cookbook. It's a recipe at the front to just to get the thing working. Right. So regardless of all the other information we provide, if they want details on why, how the features work or other things, then they can delve into that. But then mm -hmm. a lot of people, until they start using the new features, they're not going to be interested in that until they have a need for the feature, right? Then they're not going to be interested in learning about it. So that's kind of the way it works. Um, but overall, I'm pretty happy with uh, the responses. It's kind of what I expected in terms of the number of people and the different groupings of people. But I'm looking forward to seeing how well, how, how long it, basically I'm interested to see how long it takes for this firmware to get migrated out into the existing customer base. It might take six months for 90% of the people to get the upgrade installed, mm. you know? I don't know. One of the things about the upgrade with the firmware, and I'm not sure how many people it takes, a, you're required to have the uh, serial port cable, right? To connect to the computer because that's the only way sure. to do the upgrade is through the serial cable and a lot of people haven't bothered to buy a cable because they just use explore stars wirelessly uh so they don't they don't use ascom they just use it you know visually with explore stars and so there's a certain percentage of customers like that i'm not sure what the percentage is i probably need to create another um survey to ask yeah I asked that that type question. of thing what kind of level yeah. what at what level do you use the pmc8 do you just use explore stars visually by itself do you use explore stars to do astrophotography do you use ascom at a basic level you know different levels of stuff and then maybe figure that out it could be 30 percent of the people out there just use explore stars wirelessly and they don't do anything else so at that point i may expect they're doing visual work Right. So at that point, you may only get like 60 or 70 percent um, upgrade people that upgrade their system. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So um, but, you know, for all of you that might be listening, you know, you definitely want to get that cable uh, because, um, you know, we've done this major upgrade, which, as I mentioned before, is. When you've, after you've done the upgrade, you're really like getting a brand new product. It is, right. it is that much of a change. So, and it's um, much easier to use. That's the biggest thing for, especially people that use it in different ways. They take advantage of the flexibility of the system and want to use it. They might want to use it with Explore Stars one night, and then they want to use it as, with the, uh, to do astrophotography the next night, something like that. You know, I think a lot of people that do astrophotography also do outreach and do, you know, observing yes. with their family you know just under that's the right. sky visually you know that's right i mean you even take a guy like christopher go who's i mean world famous for his planetary images you'd think that he would never look through an eyepiece because he's <laughs> constantly taking images but uh he likes to do outreach and uh when we saw during the uh, great conjunction uh you know he was doing outreach with his family uh, in the Philippines, and uh, they could barely wait to get their eyes on the eyepiece to actually really see it for themselves, you know, so. Right, so there's there's need for, for different ways of using the system, and we provide that the best we can. Right, right. Well, good. So um, let's, uh, let's see who's on today. We got... Uh, we have James, the astrophotographer, on, uh, Shailendra Sharma's on, Norm Hughes, um, Richard Grace says hello, uh, Mike Wiesner, hi from yet again, Wendy, Arizona. I, I don't know, Mike, I mean, I, I, I like the dark skies of Arizona, but it sounds like it's really windy there. <laughs> um, it was really windy yesterday here. I, I, was, it was it? Really, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and we were getting yeah. 40. 30 to 40 mile per hour winds during the day yesterday. Um, let's see. Mike Wiesner says, thanks to PECA for joining the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I mean, Mike is very, very involved with the International Dark Sky Association and uh, is um, one of the uh, key people involved in uh, reviewing applications for dark sky status of you know, different uh, parks and 
facilities that uh, are applying for that. We just had uh, a recent, uh, a couple of places near me that just got recently got certified for an internet for as an IDA site. Um, oh, where were those? A couple up, up on the uh, Appalachian Trail. On oh, okay. The, uh, on Skyline Drive here in Virginia, there's a couple of locations. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of one's called Sky Meadows or something. That we nice a name. lot of people, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of the clubs here in Virginia go there to observe. But they finally got the dark sky uh, certification there. And there's a there's a couple other places uh, west. Um, I think. I have to go find uh, find the email. Mm -hmm. I just got the notice about it of a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. But that's cool that uh, that people here in Virginia are working on certain locations to get that certification also. Right, right. Um, we have uh, Chris Larson with us, Brian Fanning, uh, Andrew Corkle. Um, let's see. Uh, Harold Locke says, uh, I'm going to have to join that also. My area needs to become aware. Whether or not you're a member of the International Dark Sky Association or not, it's a good idea to do your part to keep uh, light pollution down. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's great for us as amateur astronomers, but the big reason why is because our, our own health, the health of, of animals that live in our environment, insects, uh, birds. I mean, I could just keep going down this list of why we all need dark skies. You know, we all evolved to uh, to live uh, at least uh, half of our lives in the dark. So, you know, and we need it. So, um, uh, let's see. And thanks, guys, for helping me with the volume issues. Sometimes, I, as I mentioned, we get videos that don't have great volume, but they have great information. Um, and we did talk a little bit about, uh, Harold points out that most breaking and entering and other crimes are done during the day. Yeah, um, you know, they have to, criminals have to see their victims. They have to see their values, valuables they're about to steal. They're less conspicuous during the day because, you know, otherwise you got flashlights and stuff and they can, you know, so people can see, you know. And, uh, you know, they're not out there with night vision. They're, they're out there, you know, trying to be opportunists, you know, in some way or another. Um, Mike Wiesner says, closed airports are still available as emergency landings places. Hence, some, some are still lit at night. Understood. Well, the uh, standard in America, I, think, I guess it's the same way over. Um, airports have a lighting system, the landing lights that you turn on and off with the radio there's a clicking when you click the transmit button on the light there's different ways to set the lighting values and you know low medium and high based on the number of clicks that's a standard thing with the with the smaller airports anyway i, I don't know if it is with the bigger airports but smaller airports the lights typically stay on five or ten minutes after you've clicked it so that you can land um or after you turn the landing lights the uh, the uh, runway lights on and mm -hmm. then they go off. So there is a system to keep them off in smaller uh, airports uh, that's been around for a long time. Uh, is that mostly the purpose is just to save energy or? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that, I don't, it's, I'm sure it's not directly related to anything, any concern about the dark skies. It's more yeah. related to that type of thing, I'm oh, sure. But it's more efficient. pay the bill to keep those lights on. Right, exactly. <laughs> Smaller airports, they can't, you know, the budgets are somewhat small. Um, sure. And it takes a lot of energy to light these runway lights. Um, but that's that's been around for a long time, that type of system. And it's basically over the, over the uh, CTAF, the common traffic advisory frequency or the unicom frequency on the uh, airport that you click the, the transmit button and it'll turn the lights on if you're approaching an airport to land. Oh, wow. Okay. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, Ken Noble mentions he said he installed and tested the new firmware. No issues. I'll provide a more detailed update on the forum. He oh, says, great. I'm looking forward to receiving his free laws, Mandy G15, and the special mount, which is unspoken. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
that's the secret project you just let out there. 15 yeah right. mm -hmm. that's right um we I, I will mention you know um, since we're kind of touched on product a little bit we did receive some of the first pulsar domes uh so i was uh, checking those out we got uh, a couple of the 2.2 meter ones and a 2.7 meter one oh, uh, in great. stock i think they're all sold uh right now except for one and uh, so if you're interested in a beautiful fiberglass dome uh you know uh, look us up um Let's see. Chris Larson says, for your information, the Planetary Society has form letters online that you can send directly to various representatives. The formats are entirely editable, edit, editable, and uh, I think that uh, I think, and I think not 100%. They even have some IDA letters. Um, and Eduardo says he did not see the survey on the open go to forum so yeah look through the recent messages you'll see um uh, i'm not sure if you got your email set up to receive messages as they're sent out but if you look at the recent messages on the main forum you'll see the poll there mm -hmm. if you're interested in filling it out dave carey uh said he tried updating to the new uh firmware using the 1.04 software and it didn't work. He says, yeah. and after your update, used 1.3 and everything's fine. Thank you. Yeah, there's a. I did post a message early on the day after, I think, that I posted that I discovered that the 104 version doesn't, it only it only installs the firmware into RAM instead of, it doesn't, doesn't install it into the EEPROM like it should. So the RAM memory just, of course, gets wiped out every time you restart the system. And the system boots up and reads it out of the EEPROM. But if you didn't write it to the EEPROM, then it's going to revert back to the old firmware is what it does. So the 103 version, uh, Chris, Chris Moses actually is aware of it, and he's working on correcting that. But again, it's uh, in the 104 version. The 104 version is still considered beta. But uh, Chris will work on that and get it up to speed, and then we'll be able to take advantage of these couple of other upgrades that are involved with that up with that version mm -hmm. um pekka mentions he says we're living in the 20th century and have sent probes all over the solar system so we should be able to control street lights on ground level <laughs> that's true that's true we put man on the moon and we should be able to do this right so um, Mike Wiesner says, I, w I was the chair of the IDA committee, but resigned last year to devote more time and energy to my battle with Congress. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and more conversation, great conversation about uh, lights and... Um, Smartphone camera adapters, which Mike Wiesner is helping people out with, which is cool. And uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, I think that's all we have to report today. We hope you're uh, uh, you know appreciating the planet that you live on. It is International Earth Day, and um, so um, how's you know, how's the program the new program with the microscopy how's that working with them you know i've only had one so far the second yeah. program i was going to have i had i had a technical problem so i wasn't able to to broadcast that but i've solved that and um, my computer for whatever reason my, it's a windows computer and it just choked for <laughs> i don't know why <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't know Windows. why, but but, uh, but it's uh, it's all okay now, and um, I've got a whole lineup of micro micro critters that are are uh, <laughs> just <laughs> dying to get out and yeah <laughs> and do their thing. So we have some, I have some euglena, okay. I have some paramecium. I've got some uh, proteus amoebas. Of course, I have tardigrades. You know, so, mm -hmm. and I, I think I have, 
I don't have them yet. I'm, I've I've ordered some Volvox, and Volvox, uh, and they're beautiful. So uh, I'll save that for later. But yeah, I'll be broadcasting that tomorrow. Um, and uh, I think I inspired Kent to get a microscope in his office, so I think he might try to join me. Uh, Dave Iker has also gotten a microscope and uh, will join me uh, maybe tomorrow or another show. So we'll have to see if he's able to come on. But uh, uh, Fridays are very busy for Dave Iker. So, um, but uh, I'll be there. And um, uh, also tomorrow we have uh, uh, the Astronomical League Live uh, number five. Uh, and so we've got uh, Howard Eskildson. And uh, oh. uh, you remember that uh, song that the, that the um, uh, it was uh, done by um, uh, oh, the comedy group that did the song about galaxies and they came out of the refrigerator and oh. uh, <laughs> Monty Python. <laughs> Monty Python, yeah. <laughs> So I don't know if he's going to sing it or <laughs> going to do it or what, you know. So I don't, I don't get, you know, I don't get a lot of uh, inside information. I just know that little tidbit, but it's going to be worth watching. Howard is an incredible uh, uh, lunar imager. Uh, I know he's a colleague of yours, Jerry. Um, oh yes, mm -hmm. you know, and so he's, he's well awesome. well known for in, you know super high resolution uh, lunar imaging. Yeah, he does and, awesome uh, work. Yep. Man, the dude knows the moon like the back of his hand. So mm -hmm. better than the back of his hand, I think. So, um, yep. but I get to see I get to see lunar images from him almost every day, and uh, solar images from him almost every day. And he does white light, calcium K and H alpha uh, images of the sun. So whether there's sunspots or you know nothing going on or something going on, he's very diligent. So that's that's very cool. Um, Ernie Jacobs says, if I had a nickel for every time my computer did something weird, I could afford a few more telescopes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'd be able to afford a, you know, uh, a whole new observatory complex. So, mm -hmm. the, you know, we all run into those weird things. But um, anyways, um, I think I have it figured out at least for tomorrow and uh, keeping fingers crossed. And... Um, do you have anything more you'd like to share, Jerry, before we go? No, I think uh, any any uh, PMC8 owners out there, please uh, chime in with your results uh, with yeah. the uh, firmware upgrade and the yeah. and the ASCOM driver. Um, we have improved some things with the performance that I'd like to hear more about from customers if they've noticed it or not. You know, I'd just like to to understand more of what their experience is with it. Yep. And um, uh, if uh, you have any such questions, you can, yeah, of course, you can use the forum and you can also contact us at Explore Scientific. Uh, go, you can use explorescientific.com and just jump on our live chat or call us at 866-252-3811. Mm -hmm. Until then, you guys keep looking up. Hi, I'm Kent Mars from Explore Scientific. Today we're going to talk about eyepieces. When you're out visual observing, the telescope is half the equation. The other half of the equation are eyepieces. The Explore Scientific family of eyepieces are waterproof, which means they're easy to clean and do other atmospheric disturbances do not affect them. The eyepieces come in these decorative wheelchair planisphere boxes, the blue one or the white one. The newest member of the family of Explore Scientific eyepieces is the 52 degree eyepiece. We developed it in response to customer requests. The other members of the family are the 62 degree eyepiece, the 68 degree eyepiece, the degree eyepiece, eyepieces, and the astonishing 120 degree 9 millimeter eyepiece, which immerses you in the night sky. To take a look at our family of eyepieces, or to buy them, go to explorescientific.com and click on the eyepiece tab.